good evening welcome back to my channel or good i don't know good night <laughs> welcome back to my channel the time is 12 21 a.m that is why i'm like saying good night but it's still in the morning time i hope you guys are doing amazing um it's no longer valentine's day but if i didn't tell you happy valentine's day i'm telling you now happy valentine's day although we're past valentine's I hope you guys are doing amazing. Today we're doing our Bible study and um, we're doing Hosea chapter nine. I'm really excited about this one because this is the second time I'm actually filming the Bible study. And just there's just been a lot that's been going on um, that Jesus Christ has been revealing to me. And, and especially about my about me and about my gifts and my role to play in the body of Christ and and I know that with this type of gifting not everyone is going to actually like you because you are revealing things that <laughs> that are really I don't know if it's deliberately eaten to mislead people or I'm not even sure because a lot of people say they have a relationship with God but do you really have the right relationship with the Lord is the question. And so, and yeah, and how is your relationship with the Lord? But yeah, there are people that are really just either going to help you to deepen your relationship with God or they're going to push you away from him and you know, they might not do it in a way that is very, like, sudden. They would do it very gradually until it finally happens that that day you just kind of snap and then, you know, it just happens, right? And then you sleep away and you backslide. But on this page, like, I want you to know Jesus Christ for who he really is. And there's just been so much misinformation and misinterpretation of the word of the Lord that is really bringing people away from him and it's not just in the interpretation of things but it's also in how the message is being translated into other versions and this is not even like everyone knows this right that or oh, just read KJV version and then like you'll be fine but then we all go through this phase in our lives where we kind of go through doubts, right? And then you go to other translations, right, to get interpretation, but then you eventually stumble on the wrong one sometimes and you just take it in. But the word that God is trying to say is not that. It's like I'm talking with my husband and is telling me, and then there's somebody, my husband is, for example, is in Iceland, and I'm basically um, kind of telling this intermediary, um, oh, like, you know, my husband is trying to t tell this intermediary who is the one that's going to actually write what he's saying to send to me. And, uh, and the intermediary is basically saying that, interpreting what my husband is saying as, well, what maybe he's saying, um, I love you and I can't wait to get home. But the intermediary basically says, I want to stay here. I think this place feels like home. So, <laughs> and then I get the letter and I'm like reading it and I'm like, okay, I'm like he is calling that place home and maybe he doesn't want to come home, right? So that is just like an example of like how misinformation can really affect our relationship with the Lord. And I feel like a lot of people don't really understand the, the gravity of this. And, and many people, too many people are very close-minded. And this is something that's really promoted in the Christian community. They're very close-minded to really hearing the truth of the Lord from a perspective that they never thought was possible. And so they've just closed their ears to actually possibly debunking certain things and you know um I just pray for anyone watching any of my videos that the Lord will help you to give the truth a chance 
the Lord will help you to give him a chance, right? Give him a chance to, to really have that relationship with you. Um, I just wanted to share that. Um, I'm going to be sharing more as we continue, but I, I told you guys already that this is the second time I'm actually doing this Bible study tonight because of something really happened that really discouraged me. Like, and especially like after the teaching from yesterday, like, I finally made up the mind, my mind that, you know, I'm going to switch from Second Corinthians to going to studying the doctrines of the Lord and really from Jesus Christ, like his parables, like go back to the one and, you know, really sit at, sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. I feel like many of us, we idolize certain people we idolize human beings books from humans and and we we don't really you know put so much emphasis on the word of the lord like and when somebody tells you like the only thing that you need is the word of the lord some people like say well not really like <laughs> we we tend to want to rely on other sources apart from the source that is inside of us, which is the Holy Spirit, that helps us to understand the word of the Lord better, edifies our soul, our spirit, renews our mind. And I just wish that people will just sit down and just like read the word of the Lord <laughs> for themselves. I wish you knew the power of the word, but also the power of interpretation and in shaping the culture in the church. So this is why it's important that I come up here, even when it's 12, 28 a.m. to teach Bible study or to teach or preach because misinformation has to be broken down and I'm, I was thinking this evening like wow yeah like you're thinking very utopian and do you think that men of God that have been preaching some gospel will suddenly just change what they're preaching and you know just like be um and then start to preach another you know teaching or you know and I'm like well, yeah, but Jesus intervened. <laughs> Jesus intervened. He really, he really just, yeah. Yeah, but I have gotten the encouragement that I need. And um, and I just feel renewed and edified in my spirit. And yeah, I've been fed, you know. I need to be fed first before I actually feed anybody. So <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to continue what I'm doing, right? And I'm going to go even deeper. Um, but I know that I just need to really, like, I just, I need Jesus, like, every day. And you also need Jesus. Like, we can't do this thing ourselves. Like, we can't trust in any man to, like, even Paul. We can't trust in Paul. We can't trust in James, John, Peter, whoever they are. They're not Jesus Christ. We, we need Jesus. He's the one. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one. Any other rule except for his own rulership is going to be imperfect. And yes, you need to fast. You can't just rely on God to do things for you, to, to cast down imagination and all of these things that Paul said in the previous verse, saying that, well, even if, can we, we can go back and watch the video, okay? We are also to play our part.
we're supposed to play a part. I need Jesus. We can't rely on anybody else to do what Jesus is supposed to be doing. We need him every day. We need him. Thank you. I trust him with like my, with everything and with like, even my, my, my interpretation is of things because I know how powerful interpretation can be. I need him for sanity. I need him for everything. And I just think how interesting how God really has blessed me. I feel like when I was in the world, I was dead. And for the past years that I've been in Christ Jesus, I just, I, I know that there's been an awakening, like living in alive, living in the life that God has called me into. It's like as if I'm born anew. It's like I'm getting to know myself again. Things are burst inside of me. And so, Jesus Christ is God and is precious and he deserves your righteousness. Even when it's hard, just remember If you go back, to what trapped you, to cost you your relationship with Jesus. And I don't know somebody out there, maybe you've gone through trauma in your life or you've gone through like abuse or whatever it might be. And you felt, and you, you know, that, that thing happened to you or that experience happened to you and you keep reliving that experience in your head. I just want you to know that you won. You won the battle. The fact that you're here in Christ Jesus and you believe in him without anyone belief, you're strong in him. Here right now watching this video. You won. The devil tried to trap you. And it did. For a season there. In fact, it planned everything, programmed everything perfectly just for you to fall in that trap. And you did. Because you didn't really know Jesus. Or perhaps you went against his counsel, his commandment. But Jesus came to the rescue because you're here. And you won. The devil trapped you but you came out of it you came out of the of the other side stronger and he's restoring you so this is why we have to rejoice this is why we have to be happy and rejoice 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 no matter what's happening let's rejoice because the enemy has no old on our lives the enemy has lost the battle because Jesus Christ won. We are on Jesus Christ's side. He is the winner. So we are winners too because we're on his team. And we need to be team players as well. We can't leave the job to Jesus. He won't fast for you. He won't pray for you. He won't read your Bible for you. You need to do it. Oh, I'm so grateful. I really am. Like, I really am. Okay. So, we're going to start today's Bible study. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today to glean from your word. And I pray that as I teach today, oh God, I allow you to teach through me in Jesus' name. 
And my Father, I worship you, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for clearing every doubt, clearing every every injury, O oh God, brought by the enemy. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing everything that is eaten into light, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Abba Father, for in Jesus' mighty name I pray. And I pray that whatever distraction the enemy is trying to bring into this Bible study, Father, from either from my end or from the, from the Odyssey's end, I block it now in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Oh, okay, so I'm going to begin Hosea chapter 9. And it says, KJV, do not rejoice, Israel. Do not be jubilant like the other nations, for you have been unfaithful to your God. You love the wages of a prostitute at every threshing floor. Threshing floors and wine presses will not feed the people. The wine, the new wine will fail them. They will not remain in the Lord's land. Ephraim will return to Egypt and eat unclean food in Assyria. They will not pour out wine offerings to the Lord, nor will their sacrifices please him. Such sacrifices will be to them like the bread of mourners. All who eat them will be unclean. This food will be for themselves. It will not come into the temple of the Lord. What will you do on the day of your appointed festivals, on the feast days of the Lord? Even if they escape from destructions, Egypt will gather them and Memphis will bury them. The tre their treasures of silver will be taken over by briars and thorns will overturn, overrun their tents. The days of punishment are coming. The days of reckoning are at hand. Let Israel, let Israel know this. I'm sorry, guys. Let Israel know this because your sins are so many and your hostility so great. The prophet is considered a fool, the inspired person, a maniac. The prophet, along with my God, is the watchman over Ephraim, yet snares are with him on all his paths. An hostility in the house of his God. They have sunk deep into corruption as in the days of Giber. God will remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing the early fruit of the fig tree. But when they came to Baal Pier, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vow as the thing they loved. Ephraim's glory will fly away like a bird, no birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Even if they rear children, I will bereave them of everyone. What to them when I turn away from them? I have seen Ephraim like Tyra, planted in a pleasant place. But Ephraim will bring out their children to the slayer. Oh, give them, Lord. What will you give them? Give them wombs that miscarry and breasts that are dry. Because of all their wickedness in Gilgal, I hated them there because of their sinful deeds. I will drive them out of my house. I will no longer love them. All their leaders are rebellious. Ephraim is belighted. Their root is withered. They yield no fruit. Even if they bear children, I will slay their cherished offspring. My God will reject them because they have not obeyed him. They will be wanderers among the nations. All right. So now we're going to go into the analysis of things. Again, we're doing the KJV version. Um, so it's what we did now was NIV. Oh my gosh. So it's supposed to be. And I'm like, so we're going to read the KJV version. <laughs> we're going to read the KJV version. Okay, guys. Um, okay, so let's do this again. Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people, for thou hast gone a whoring from thy God, thou hast loved a reward upon every conflict. Let's just like do the analysis anyways. So basically, like God is speaking through Uzziah here, right? And it's then Uzziah that will tell people of Israel that they shouldn't rejoice for joy like other people because like they are disobedient right 
Thou hast loved a reward upon every cornflower. They have gone whoring about, right? So it says the, the floor and the wine press shall not feed them and the new wine shall fail in her, okay? So basically, let's see what a cornflower is. What is it supposed to do? So there is a cornflower. It's a type of flower milled from dried whole corn kennels. So it's a floor. I said flower. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's a floor. Corn floor. So it's a, let me see. Yeah, apparently that word is very ancient. What is it? Um, I think it's an ancient word. It's a threshing floor. A threshing floor, it says. Um, okay. Um, so I can guess like it's probably supposed to be used to thrash corn and turn it into some type of corn flour. So maybe they're just there, you know, since it's supposed to do something. And um, and this is very um symbolic, right? For you know them whoring about to like going to like the shrines of like all the gods. We're supposed to kind of give them something, so like they're kind of like waiting for the benefits of like you know what the other no god idols are going to basically give them. And uh, it says here, the flow and the wine press shall not feed them. And the new wine shall fill in her. So they're basically not going to help in any way. Like they're going to actually go through a lot of famine. So the, the the gods that they're relying on will not basically help them. And they will now be in deficits. And they shall not dwell in the land, the Lord's land. But Ephraim shall return to Egypt and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. I'm sorry, guys. It's just pretty late. It's past my bedtime, like way past my bedtime but we're here and we're gonna do what we have to do and it says um they shall not dwell in the lord's land but ephraim shall return in egypt for they shall eat unclean things right this reminds me of um the story in the book of um it's not a story it's like it just reminds me of genesis chapter four of um how it reminds me of Eden, right? They shall not dwell, they shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt. And Egypt just kind of symbolizes, you know, the dry land. When Adam and Eve had disobeyed the commandment of, of the Lord, the Lord had cursed them, right? And he cursed the earth. So the earth was basically not going to bring forth any. Like man would have to toil, basically. Um, I'm just kind of paraphrasing here. Man would have to toil and toil and toil. And even when he gets something from, you know, the earth, like because of the amount of effort he had put into getting that, it's, he's going to be ultimately like dissatisfied and he's never going to be content with like, you know, everything that he has because like he's always going to be putting more effort and less gain in a way. Um, so basically yeah that is that and then um and let's continue <laughs> and then it says but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria um so basically it's just saying that well since they're gonna they're not gonna dwell in you know in the land that are basically prepared for them which refers back again it's it, it's references again you know Garden of Eden then you know, they're going to be in a land that's very unfruitful, right? And they will start to eat unclean things in Assyria. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. And it goes on to even, um, it goes on to speak about the, you know, 
the story of um, Cain and Abel, which is like a, a gradual progression of the story of like after Adam and Eve had sinned, right? And it's when um, Cain had given the Lord, you know, the 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 harvest of it, of his of his of what he has had sowed right into the soil. And Abel had given him like the first lane of his ships. Um, God had accepted the one of Abel and he rejected the one of Cain. And, you know, that caused like, you know, disappointment on the side of Cain. And, you know, we see how that reaction was and how Cain actually killed his brother. And let's continue. It says, their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. All that eat thereof shall be polluted for their bread, for, for their bread, for their soul shall not come into the house of the Lord. So this is also very significant because of, it says, their sacrifices shall be unto them um, as the bread of mourners, the bread of mourners, all that eat thereof shall be polluted, right? The bread of mourners, that, that's like when, you know, and, and well, from my analysis, Cain had killed his brother to present to the Lord Right, Cain had killed his brother to present to the Lord as some, some sacrifice. And we see that happen in Genesis chapter, chapter, in one second, Genesis chapter four, verse seven. Cain had said something. The Lord asked him in six, it says, um, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thou countenance for fallen? And it says in verse seven, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted, right? And if thou doest not well, sin light at the door and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. I think, I think I'm a little bit like, why did I even read NIV version to begin with? Because like, I really, I'm not going to be doing NIV or any other translation except from uh, KJV again. Um, yeah, I just thought that was very interesting. But in their own interpretation, they had said that, you know, um, Cain was referring here to sin. He was talking to sin. It's like, oh, um, if a man has, was rejected, um, he's not going to be well. And um, and then sin lies at the door and um, sin desires him and sin is going to rule over him. But that's not really what this is saying. It says, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not, um, not well seeing light at the door, right? That's pretty clear. And he says, and he's talking to God. God had asked him a question, right? It's referring to God. He's like, and unto thee, you, and unto you shall be his desire. Him, is, is speaking to him, himself. He's referring to himself, Cain. And thou, God, shall rule over him. So now let's look, that in, let's look at that in that context. If thou doest well, shall, and um, okay, let me just like give you guys, please. I want you to do your research and look for the word. What does the mean? The is the object of the sentence, the person receiving receiving the action. It means you, okay. It means you. Okay, it's right here. It's like it's right here, okay. Um. And there, I checked all the translations. It's the same thing. But anyways, let's get to the point of where we're actually going. If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. But unto you shall be his desire. So if, if you... So if you don't do well, right? Sin lies at the door. So he's basically, in a way, it seems like a prophecy of what he, what will happen, right? If he doesn't do well, sin lies at the door. And his desire will be God's, like it would be to please the Lord. 
And so essentially God will rule over him because it's just like the story of man, like man has, you know, fallen. And you see in the story of the book of, in, in the story of the people of Israel, like they're constantly trying to, because, you know, they're constantly trying to please the Lord. Okay. Constantly trying to do everything in the book of the law of Moses, but in their own power, they cannot, right? And so this is what he's saying. It's like, God did not, first of all, the man does not do well. If thou doest not well, right? You've sinned. Sin lies at the door, right? Now, sin is like basically like dining with you and like, just like the way it was in the in, the, in, the, in Israel. And he says, and unto thee shall be his desire. So they're always wanting to like, just like in the book of um, let me see. In the book of First Samuel, yeah, in the book of First Samuel, when um, the Lord wanted to judge the house of Eli, and you know, yeah, just basically, um, cost about the war between Israel and the Philistine, just used that as an opportunity to bring about judgment into the house of um Eli, and then the children of Israel when they fought with the Philistines first time, like they had. The Philistine had overpowered them. And then they were like, you know what, this time around, let's go get the Ark of the Lord, right? They're always trying to like, you know, please the Lord or like bring him into their presence. But then like sin dines with them. But eventually they brought it, but then, you know, they did not win the battle. And he like, when he heard about the news that the Philistine had taken the, the Ark of the Lord, he basically, you know, fell, right? And he heard the news he was so shocked, right? And he said, thou shalt rule over him. The Lord will rule over him. The Lord will rule over him. The Lord ruled over Israel, right? They're constantly trying to please him. Um, so that was basically what he was saying And here. And that's why you see that, you know, he goes on to say that, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that um, when they were in the feud, you know, he hadn't even killed his brother at this point. What he had said was very prophetic, right? He hadn't killed his brother. And then he rose up and then killed his brother. How? He slew him as some sort of sacrifice. He slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know him. I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And then he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground, Right. Even the sacrifice that they had killed was not acceptable unto the Lord because if anything, it just shows the evil nature of man. And God could have never taken that sacrifice because God is not a God of um bow. It doesn't take human, it doesn't take human sacrifice. It says, and and now as thou curse, um, at thou curse from the earth, which has opened our mouth to receive thy brother's blood from um thy hand. So the Lord basically, you know cursed Abel. He says, and thou and, and as thou cursed from the earth, right? Since it's from the earth anyways, is is cursed. So indirectly like is basically, you know, communities if not well, not communion, but partaking in the curse of the earth. Is partaking in the curse of the earth. It says, now art thou cursed from, from the earth. The earth already was cursed even like from Genesis 1, I think, right? Or 2, right? Now it's partaken out of the curse of the, you know, of the earth. Why? Because of what? The earth had opened her mouth to partake to eat out of that sacrifice. She had opened her mouth to eat out of the sacrifice, which is that she had swallowed the blood, her brother's blood, um, sorry, the, uh, Cain's brother's blood, Abel's blood from that hand. So they were, um, you know, accomplice. This, um, her earth was accomplished to the, the murder of Abel. Like even though earth did not really participate in the murder, earth, you know, basically, you know, um, got a reward from it, okay? And I think it's really interesting 
um it's interesting like the gods of the philistines and the gods of all these people and you know they worship all of they worship many different things right and um yeah i think their origin is very questionable and like what they've done and all of these things we don't know so if, just so far you are taking a reward from it you will partake in the curse that comes with them okay that's just what it is and it says um yeah and you can let me see if i can but yeah like this is basically it's like he killed the, his brother for a sacrifice again if you go back to verse seven it says his desire his desire is to is to please the lord to please the lord and the lord will rule over him the lord, lord cursed him even more right um but yeah yep Um, let's go back to where we are at right now. I think it's still Isaiah. One second here. Let me go back. All right. So and then it says, you know, um, they shall offer, they shall not offer wine offering to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. Their sacrifices shall be unto him as the bread, you know, the bread of mourners, right? Like, the bread of mourners, let's see what that is. And this also refers to that, the book of Cain and Abel. Um, so the bread of mourners, mourners bread. Let's see. So the bread of mourners was the bread eaten during funeral celebrations, during which times all who entered the house of the dead were considered to be unclean. Okay. So all Israel is thus designated a house of the dead and a scene of mourning. That's deep. That's very deep. Like that's very, very deep. It says they shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord there. The place is the house of the dead. Okay. It says, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. Their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. All that eat thereof shall be what's polluted. For their bread, for their soul, shall not come into the house of the Lord. So again, going back to the story of um, Cain and Abel, um, yeah about how the earth is actually cursed and how she partakes in the murder of um, Abel by actually getting a reward from it. Um, the Lord originally cursed the earth, right? And basically this is like, the Lord is saying here that you're not going to come into the, the, the house, my house, because of, you know, you've eaten, you know, the bread of mourners, Right, just like the earth had drunk the blood of Abel, you know, and so they're polluted. The earth is polluted. People in it is polluted. That's why sin is just everywhere because the earth itself is polluted. And I would like to talk about the um, the curse of the Lord upon Adam, Eve, and um and the serpent okay but i just want to um, also just emphasize that the role of the serpents basically is to eat the dust dust like the good it's gonna it's gonna feed on the dust and if man is made from the dust of the ground then man essentially is dust okay and so yeah that's why there's a lot of things happening because the serpents got to eat, you know, if you read it very well. Um, anyways, may the Lord continue to protect us and um, preserve us. Verse 4 says, um, 
what will ye do in the solemn day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? Okay. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. The pleasant places for their silver nettles, nestles shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacles. So basically, um, yeah. In the day that's supposed to be the feast of the Lord, from their perspective and from their reality, a day that's supposed to be a day of celebration is actually a day of destruction for them. Like they're going through oppression, like very deep oppression. People are dying left and right. And it's really just sad and gloomy and dark. It says the days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad for the multitudes of thine iniquity and thy and the great hatred. So basically, like, well, if the prophet has been had been preaching about how there's gonna be judgment, you know, and how people are gonna be punished, and um yeah, and they don't believe when that day eventually comes. When that day comes, they will know. They will know. For the multitude of thine iniquity, they will know. Right? And it talks about how they actually are oppressing, you know, the prophets and the spiritual man. They regard them as foolish and mad because of their hate. They hate to hear the word of the Lord, the truth. They hate because of their multitude of their of the of multitude of their sins. It says the watchman of Ephraim was with God. It's like a veil upon their eyes. The watchman of Ephraim was with my God, but the prophet is a snare of a fowler in all his ways, and it shred in the house of the Lord of his God. Okay. You see that? The watchman of Is of Ephraim, sorry, was with my God. Okay. It says, but the prophet now is a snare. Isn't that interesting? A fowler is not, you know, it's always the it's on it's the bad one. That shall not um yeah, do you know in Psalm 91, right? <laughs> It's a verse there. But yeah. So the prophet now is like a snare of, of a foul line in all his ways. That's interesting. says they have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Giber. Corruption in the church, in the amongst God's people. I want to look into the word snare of the fowler. It's a fowler is a bird, a bird catcher, and a snare is a type of sleep, sleep knot. You see that a bird catcher, and so he says, like the prophet is like a trap in all his ways. An hatred in the house of his Lord. I 
And it says, therefore, it will remember their iniquity. It will visit their sins. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw her fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Balpir and separated themselves unto that shame and their abominations were according as they loved. So they were doing a sort of evil things, evil, and just anything they wanted to do. And it says, as for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. For the birth and from the womb and from the, the conception, though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them, and they, there shall be not, there not, there shall not be a man left, yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. And it says, Ephraim, as I saw, Tyrus is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. It says, though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them that there shall be, there shall not be a man left. If I'm is planted in a pleasant place and brings his children to the murderer, the murderer who? Who is the murderer? The gods that they serve, bow, or whatever gods that hacks them to kill their children. I think it's really interesting. And here, it's talking about Ephraim. See, the watchman of Ephraim was with my God. And the prophet is a snare of Fowler in all his ways. So the prophet basically is a trap in his ways. Because the prophet only prophesies the word of the Lord. I mean, those ones that are really prophets of the Lord. And it talks about how really there is hatred in the house of the Lord. Hate, corruption, lies, hypocrisy. They have deeply cor corrupted themselves. And it says, I'll remember their iniquity and visit and he will visit their sins. And speaking about Israel here, I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. You remember? Israel it was Abraham, right? God saw the potential in Abraham and just what he could do with them and how he could, you know, bring about hope, salvation, restoration, bring them back into the lost glory. But they went to Balper. That's another God. God is actually speaking about Baal, but it's actually Balper and separated themselves onto that shame. That shame, that shame of a of a idol. That one that asked them to kill their children. 
and the abomination, abominations, right? So we're according as the loved. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away. They lost their glory. Whatever glory that they had left, they even lost it like a bird. They separated themselves unto that shame and their abominations were according as they loved. From the birth, from the womb, and from the conceptions, all of the glory that they had from the birth, from the womb, from the conception, everything gone. No glory anymore. Empty vessel. And it says, though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them. Let's look at what bereave means. It means to deprive, be deprived of a loved one um, through a profound absence, especially during the loved one's death. Okay, so yet will I bereave them, but there shall not be a man left. Yea, more also to them when I depart from them. So God is basically saying that even with your empty glory, like I'm still with you, but wait till the time when I'm actually going to leave you. And it says, Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, is planted in a pleasant place, right? Which is with the Lord. Even though Tyrus is always actually portrayed to be this very unfaithful nation, at this time it was planted in a plant pleasant place. But Ephraim was disobedient and very it was like uh, committing whoredom. And Ephraim shall bring forth his children to bad pure, to the wicked idol, that one that demands for them to do human sacrifice. He says, Give them, O Lord, what will thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast. So that they wouldn't continue. I feel like this is pretty justifiable because that they wouldn't continue to give his children, right? The Lord's children to some no God idol. And it says, all their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Ephraim is smitten, their roots is dried up, no glory. They shall bear no fruit, not even children, barren, though they bring forth. They shall bear no fruit, though they bring forth. So, you know, they can mate, 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 but no, they are not having any kids, no children, no pregnancy. Yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb okay so he's just saying like well they will mate even if it turns into like a, you know fetus they will have miscarriages and it says um my god will cast them away because they did not hearken unto him and they shall be wanderers among the nations so yeah so the lord is going to deal with them very treacherously they will not even have a land like a place to call home because of they're going to be scattered about just wandering without you know you know who knows what's going to happen to them maybe at this point many of them probably as they've lost their identity and just wandering about here um but yeah this is basically like what god is saying through Uzziah about the unfaithful ephraim and israel um and i'll and we'll basically connect the story to you know, Genesis chapter four, the story of Cain and Abel and also Adam and Eve of when they actually fell and what really happened. And we talked about the earth and how the earth is really cursed and um, the significance of that story in this one. Um, and um, God basically saying that he's going to take them out of his house, he says here. Um, 
I will, I will drive them out of mine house. Okay. So, yeah. And it says here too, like, you know, um, they will not dwell in the, in the Lord's land. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I feel like the symbolism of the house and the land of the Lord, you know, even though we know already that the earth is actually cursed, is that the land in the house of the Lord is basically, you know, a spiritual uh, connotation to his peace, his fruitfulness, abundance, his uh, mercy, how he honors you, respects, you know, everything in and all, like, God is a is a God is a spirit and so yeah like there's no length or breadth to where he resides and so what we just need for us to be in the land or the house of the Lord is to be in his presence and so he says like they will not dwell in the Lord's land okay the Lord's presence and he goes down to saying that you know I will cast them away because they do not hearken unto him. My God will cast them away because they do not hearken unto you know, him. Um, the way is the power it says, um, um, we just viewed it just now. I'm like, where is it just now? Anyways, oh yeah, it says here, verse 15, I will drive them out of mine house, okay, because of the wickedness that they've committed. Um, but yeah. Just imagine like if you're not able to, and I talked about the story of the, the first Samuel about how they literally ran to grab the um, the Ark of the Lord when they actually noticed that, oh my God, like we're actually losing to the Philistines, right? Uh, and they did bring the Ark of the Lord, but even still, like the presence of the Lord, um, like again, it was the will of the Lord that they would lose the battle because of, to bring about, um, you know, his wrath into the house of Eli, um, but yeah, and and that basically just signifies that essentially, like who you are confounded with or confounded with in terms of like you know blood or nation and location, environment, and so on, can really affect your destiny. And um, you know, I think we're we're very fortunate to be linked with Jesus and the fact that we carry that environment that you know, wherever we are we know that the presence of the lord is because of you know we're on the lord's side and so um are you worshiping idols <laughs> do you have any <laughs> no okay i'm i'm trying i can i said no to myself but you answer it to yourself uh for yourself i mean um but yeah so like we're on the lord's side so you know we carry the presence of the lord with, with us because the, our god is spirit and and so we're not bound to a physical geographical location to be uh, labeled as you know um the lords and so whatever whatever that's happening around us does not really affect us what it really affects us is really a spiritual um geometry is that even a, yeah um yeah i meant another word though our spiritual like <laughs> status right spiritual status um in terms of like, you know, yeah, maybe geographical, yeah, a spiritual status in terms of um, relationship, okay, relationship, yes. Um, in terms of belief, do we believe in Jesus Christ? Um, are we playing our part in the body of Christ? Are we playing our part in order for us to, you know, facilitate you know the the vision of the lord upon our lives and upon you know the lives of other people outside and in the ministry or in the body of christ okay um so yeah like and so much more <laughs> well yeah um that's just basically what i wanted to say for isaiah chapter nine i don't know what i'm gonna well, I think I, I might just think about something, but for the title, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think like we talked like a lot about this topic and I feel like I'm pretty much okay with like how the Bible study ended today. I know it's a pretty long one, but it had to like for us to be able to continue from the topic that we talked about yesterday. I feel like 
there needs to be a lot of clarification and like to, to kind of bring your mind where it ought to be in our journey throughout the year in our Bible study. Okay, so yeah. So I'm going to pray. Every Father, I thank you, Lord, for everything that you did through this Bible study. I give you all the glory, O Lord, in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, for where you're taking us from glory to glory, O Lord, even in this ministry, O Father, in Jesus' name. And my Father, I thank you for what you did today, O Lord, in revealing your truth, O Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your dying on that cross for us, O God. Thank you, Father, for illuminating our life, illuminating our parts, O God. Thank you, Father, for revealing your truth, O Lord, in Jesus' name, through, O Lord, your, your to the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. And Father, Lord, we open our minds, our soul, our spirit, O oh God, to receive even more from you, O oh Lord. Pour into us, O oh God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. But Father, I glorify your name, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. And that we worship you, O oh God. And as we continue, O oh God, till the end of this week, O oh God, I pray that you continue to protect us, guide us, O oh God, in Jesus' name. And that we worship you, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Be thou exalted, O oh Lord. For in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. So guys, thank you so much for watching this Bible study for today. I am going to go ahead and go to bed. I hope you guys have an amazing night, morning, or whenever you're watching this. And um, yeah, if you want to go ahead and like, subscribe, comment, and do all of those things, go ahead and do that. And um, I know that God blessed you through um, just you watching this video. And I pray that I will continue to bless and pour into you. Bye, guys.